Good morning. Good to see you this morning. We're uh, left side heavy. <laughs> they, these folks over here don't have cooties, just so you know. <laughs> so uh, anyway, welcome to worship. Um, and just wanted to highlight a few announcements as we start out. The flowers were given in honor of Melda Neubauer's birthday by her family, Donna and John Hack and Brianna and uh, Tyler and Shelby Farrington. And uh, so I wanted to point out that I'm starting another one of the DVD studies. This one is on Wednesday at 6. Uh, we'll have pizza, salad, and dessert. And then if you part of the DVD, um, it's a video study, I Am Loved, Walking in the Fullness of of God's love based on first John the you know gospel writer uh, John also wrote three epistles three letters and this is on first John which is the um, the most important um, and longest of the three letters the others are very tiny so with that I'm going to turn it over to uh, Jeff as we begin our period of, of worship Good morning. Good morning. Let's join together for the call to worship. I trust in you, Lord. I say, you are my God. My times are in your hands. Save me in your unfailing love. All right. <laughs> How abundant are the good things you have stored up for those who fear you, O oh God. Praise be to the Lord, for he has showed me the wonders of his love. Love the Lord, all his faithful people. Be strong, Be strong and, and take, take heart, heart, all who hope in, in the Lord. Lord. Now let's join together in our opening hymn, Jesus Loves Me, 191 in the hymnal.
You may be seated. I invite you to turn in the back or towards the back of your hymnal to number 481 and let us join in the prayer with St. Francis, page 481. St. Francis lived in the 13th century in Italy. Please join me in prayer. Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope, where there is darkness, light, and where there is sadness, joy. O divine master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love, for it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. Before we do that, we're going we're gonna to remain seated and, and sing Lead Me, Lord, number 473. Jesus said to his disciples, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip, even after I have been among you for such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than that than these, because I am going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask for anything in my name, and I will do it. Before we move on to the reading from First Peter, uh, to ask, uh, to just as, as a refresher, to ask for something in Jesus' name, we have to be able to ask for something that would be in accordance with the will of God. We can't be praying for something that would be out of the will of God. You know, some obvious examples would be like, oh yeah, uh, God, can you help me to steal this car or, or this man's husband or, uh, you know, or, or, or wife or whatever, and uh, um, you know, that kind of thing. So in accordance with the will of God. So 
with that, I turn now to our liturgist for today, Tim uh, Whalen, who will read for us the reading from 1 Peter. The Apostle Peter wrote, like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation, not that you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in the scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, the stone is precious, but, the, but to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message which is also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful life. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. I just want to say a, a, just a sentence or two on the passage that Tim read. Who is the cornerstone that that passage refers to, the rock, the cornerstone? Who? Jesus. Not Peter, Jesus. Okay. Jesus is the rock, okay? He's the, he's the cornerstone, not, not, not Peter. That was Peter's nickname, but that passage, good thing I asked, I thought you all, <laughs> the, the, uh, that passage re refers to Jesus. He's the, he's the cornerstone. He's the, the foundation of the church. And in that passage where it ended with all the, the uh, it, <clears throat> it was addressed to Christians and using all sorts of language like priesthood and chosen people that in the Old Testament if you're familiar with it at all, would have applied to the people of Israel. And here is Peter, as Jesus, you know, called him the rock, but, you know, his slang, or his, not slang name, his nickname from Jesus is the rock. But referring here in this letter, Peter's referring to all the all Christians now with all these words, chosen people, royal priesthood, you know, those who are offering spiritual sacrifices as the Christ, the, all those now applying those to the people of God, to Christians, instead of the Israelites, in the, as, as it would have all those, all those precious and, and you know, potential promises were now applied to, to Christians. So um, just wanted to give you a heads up on that. So Jesus is the cornerstone. He is the, the head of the church. He's, uh, or the church is built on him. We are to be living stones, members of the household of God as Peter would call, so, uh, as Peter calls us. So there's kind of a mix of metaphors in there, but um, anyway.
Our, our gospel lesson for today is, is one of the most comforting and challenging in Scripture. Jesus spoke those words to, from John chapter, recorded in John 14, to his disciples to teach and reassure them on the night of his arrest, the day before his death. As, and so we would do well to pay attention to them as some of his parting words in, uh, before his crucifixion. Jesus knew the events of that evening and the next day would be very disturbing to his followers, yet he told them, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. There Jesus presented himself yet again as an appropriate object of our faith and trust alongside God, alongside of God who he then called his father. It might seem strange for Jesus to have to urge faith and trust in his followers after he had, you know, here he was with his closest 12 disciples after spending almost three years with them, but, but his crucifixion and his death would be very upsetting to them and his subsequent physical absence from them after his resurrection and ascension to heaven could also be potentially disturbing to them too. So he offered them these words next. My father's house has many rooms. If, I were, if it were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also can be where I am. With those words, Jesus spoke not of his return as their resurrected Lord on Easter morning on the third day and, you know, just two days after he said this, but of, he spoke instead of his second coming, his eventual return to earth to gather up all of his followers at the end of this age. I believe the Father's house refers to heaven as an actual place uh, and maybe in a spiritual realm, but where there will be lots of room for believers to be and to dwell with God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit forever. And the idea that that Jesus himself will come to gather us up so that we can be with him is a comforting one. The other Gospels refer to Jesus returning with, an, uh, uh, um, with, with glory, with an angelic host, but John doesn't mention angels here. Jesus, he just says, Jesus says, he'll come back. But the idea of Jesus preparing a place for us is also a comforting and intriguing one. It may simply mean that we as Christ followers will be included in God's house, which may refer to the, to the family of God or the kingdom of God, much as one might refer to the house of David as, you know, as those belonging to you know, David's family, David's descendants. But it might represent that and, and also something more individually prepared for each one of us, God willing, and with faith, we'll find out. Now, Jesus had told his disciples that they knew the way to the place where he was going, but, but Thomas, one of his disciples, protested, Lord, you know, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? And, and that makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, but, but Jesus had, in, had actually told them their ultimate destination to be in the presence of God, in his Father, in God's house, in his eternal kingdom. But it's no wonder they didn't, they didn't grasp all of that at that time. Yet Jesus responded with one of the most challenging and exclusive claims that he made that John records, in, that, that is recorded in the Gospels. It is one of the several I am statements that John records in his Gospel, all of which describe Jesus' Jesus's function and role and identity as the Son of God. And Jesus declared here, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And he added, if you really knew me, you will know my Father as well. From, from now on, you do know him and have seen him. Now, could any ordinary person like you and me declare that if you knew us, you'd also know God? And that if you had seen us, 
you'd also seen, it was like seeing God? Of course not. Absolutely not. But Jesus insists that we can believe that of him and should believe that of him and must believe that of him if we want to know God and have access to God. Jesus was saying that he was the only way to God, not one of many ways to God. And please allow me to share what several New Testament scholars uh, through the course of this sermon have had to say about uh, the very important claim that Jesus made in John 14, 16. A Roman Catholic scholar named Raymond Brown, one of the foremost John uh, Johannine scholar comments, and I quote, Jesus is the way because he is the truth and the life. He is the way because he is the truth or the revelation of the Father. He is the way because he is the life, since he lives in the Father and the Father lives in him. He is the channel through which the Father's life comes to people. End quote. Now that goes along with that famous verse that we all probably know by heart, John 3, 16, where, where Jesus said, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Now, John 3.18 and John 3.36 are much less familiar verses, but they are similar to Jesus' claim in John 14.6, in, in asserting that belief in Jesus is essential for salvation. John 3.18, two verses after 3.16, reads, Whoever believes in him, referring to Jesus, is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. Obviously, speaking of Jesus. And John 3.36 echoes that thought by saying, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life because God's wrath remains on him. And that life must was, must refer to e eternal life. You see, according to John, Jesus himself in John's gospel, any faith in God that rejects faith in Jesus as God's son is incomplete and cannot save us from God's wrath against sin. And why is that true? Because as God the son, Jesus took the punishment for our sins upon himself in his death on the cross. And if we reject him, we reject the only Savior available to us, the only one who can clear our sins away and make us acceptable to our holy God who sent Jesus to earth for that very purpose. D.A. Carson, another scholar, New Testament scholar, comments on John 14, 6, verse 6, like this. Jesus is the way to God precisely because he is the truth of God and the life of God. Jesus is, the, Jesus is the truth because he embodies the supreme revelation of God. Jesus says and does exclusively what the Father gives him to say and do. Indeed, he is properly called God. Jesus is God's gracious self-disclosure, his word made flesh. Jesus is the life, the one who has life in himself, the resurrection and the life, the true God and eternal life, as various scriptures point out. Only because Jesus is the truth and the life can Jesus be the way for others to come to God, the way for his disciples to attain the many dwelling places in the Father's house. Jesus so mediates God's truth and God's life that he is the very way to God, the one who alone can say, no one comes to the Father except through me, end quote. Now, hopefully we can believe this now and do believe this now, but, but at, the, at the Last Supper, Philip was still struggling to understand what Jesus had just said. So it seems like Philip breezed by the part where Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And then really didn't grasp when Jesus declared next, if you really knew me, 
you will know my father as well. From now on, you do know me and have seen him. Now, friends, that's an amazing and audacious claim that, that Jesus made, that to know him is to know God, and to see him is to see God. So clueless and misunderstanding, Philip responded to this, saying, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. And John Beasley Murray remarks about this, and I quote, Philip had failed to grasp that in Jesus, the glory, the grace, and the truth of God, whom no one has seen or can see, stands unveiled. End quote. However, John's gospel does record that, that Jesus had, something, had said something very similar to his disciples and to the crowd in the temple at Jerusalem shortly after his triumphant entry into the city with all the palm branches waving, you know, during that, that, the start of that last week of his earthly life before his death and crucifixion. John's gospel, in fact, records in chapter 2, verse 44 and 45, that Jesus said this, Whoever believes in me does not believe in me only, but in the one who sent me. And the one who sent him, of course, is God. The one who looks at me is seeing the one who sent me. So, the, so it would have been easier if Jesus had just said, the person who is looking at me is seeing God who sent me. But that's what he meant. Of course, that would have just gotten them killed a few days quicker, and he had some of his most important teaching to do, of which this passage from John chapter 14 is part. Anyway, how did then Jesus respond to, to, to Philip's request for Jesus to show the disciples God the Father? The Father. Did Jesus respond to Philip with love and patience or exasperation, or all of the three, as he gently rebuked Philip to explain the reality of his divine identity by saying these important words. Don't you know me, Philip, even after I have been among you for such a long time? And maybe three years felt like a really long time, or maybe, you know, to be with those, with those disciples you know, clueless as they are, are a lot of, or were a lot of the time. And then he continues that anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I say to you are not just my own. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. My friends, Jesus' point there was that everything he said and did, including all the miracles he performed, were designed to reveal his Father God as well as his own unique identity as the Son of God, our Messiah, our Savior, our Lord. As a Catholic theologian, Rudolf Schnackenberg explains, further explains, and I quote, Jesus' works are not simply miracles, but signs, with the spiritual intention of pointing either to Jesus as the giver of life or to his gift of life. They are not simply external works, but rather spiritual works, which help people to achieve salvation. Another person adds, and I quote, in the depths of God, in the depths of God, the being of God, there exists a fellowship between God the Father and God the Son that is beyond all compare, Unity whereby the speech and action of the Son are that of the Father in him, and the Father's speech and action come to finality in Christ. Now, 
I wouldn't presume to speak about in the being of uh, depths of God, but I think that's a good explanation. In fact, Jesus once before this time described the essential unity be between God and himself by declaring, as we find in John chapter 10, verse 30, I and the Father are one. Friends, since that is true, since Jesus said that is true, I believe that we cannot reject, and the scripture witnesses to the fact that we cannot reject faith in Christ without rejecting God himself. The bottom line is that according to scripture, if we or anyone wants to escape, escape condemnation, punishment for all our sins and wrongdoing, if we want to experience eternal life with God, we must confess our sins and believe in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. He alone is the way and the truth and the life. Not, not Buddha, not Muhammad, not any Hindu God, not Confucius, not any wacky new age, you know, you yourself are God philosophy or ancient pagan uh, practice or modern political leader or ideology. We are all, according to Jesus, unable to save ourselves without faith in him, in Jesus as our Lord and Savior. As Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to me except, no one comes to the Father, to God, except through me. So Jesus is the only available path to God, the only mediator between God and humankind. The book of Hebrews refers to him, Jesus, as our high priest. And it is absolutely imperative that we and others believe in him as our Lord and Savior and trust in him as he strongly urged us to do just before he died. We need to understand and accept the truth that everything, everything that Jesus said and did expressly was expressly done to reveal God to us and to share God's truth with us and to show God's love for us. God's love supremely revealed for us in Jesus' death on the cross, God the Son dying for us, for all of humanity. I want to share one last quote from someone else. This one's from Brown again. It's, he wrote, and I quote, In saying, I am the way, Jesus is not primarily preaching him present preaching or presenting himself as a moral guide or as a leader for his disciples to follow rather jesus is presenting himself as the only avenue of salvation in the manner of john chapter 10 verse 8 where jesus said i am the gate whoever enters through me will be saved this is so because Jesus is the truth, the only revelation of the Father who is the goal of our journey. So friends, believe in God. Believe in Jesus and be saved. Live and then out of gratitude and devotion to him, live a life of love and obedience to him and, and, and do your best to follow him. And please don't give up don't give up believing the exclusive claims that Jesus made about himself due to any misguided notions of religious tolerance or pluralism. You can love other people without and and without accepting what they believe. You can love other people and share with them the truth of the gospel, but there cannot you, you can't as a Christian legitimately say, well, you've got your truth and I've got mine. Not if you believe what Jesus said. Not if you believe what he said, that I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Amen. I invite you to stand and sing with me uh, the hymn, My Jesus, I Love Thee, number 172.
Gracious God, you, you know what's on our minds and our hearts. Help us where we struggle with doubts and lack of faith. Help us to place our trust and faith in you as our Lord and Savior, as our rock and salvation. We pray that you would be with Calvin in his upcoming surgery. We pray that your will would be done for his life and that you might guide the surgeon's hand and, and speed his recovery. And Lord, we pray for all those who are in need of your healing blessing, whether it's of mind or body or spirit. We lift up those that we know and love, all those on our prayer list, and those ways in which we might need your healing of mind or body or spirit ourselves. We pray for all those who struggle with, with depression, anxiety, and other mental illnesses and conditions, who find their view of this world and then uh, distorted and dampened. And we know that there are so many things going wrong in the world, so much violence, so much hatred, so much division. We pray for all those who have just suffered losses of life or, or health from the latest of a series of mass shootings. We pray for healing for them. We pray for their families and the losses of loved ones. We pray for peace, Lord. We pray for sanity. We pray for peace in the Ukraine, peace around the world. God, in your mercy, <clears throat> guide the leaders of the nations, ours and all the others, and your paths of peace and righteousness and justice. We are caught in cycles of war and retaliation, so many different places. Lord, we need you. We need you in our world. We need you in our hearts. May you move by your spirit powerfully in and among us and help us to be your people in word and deed. We ask all this in the name of Jesus Christ who taught us to pray to you, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Tim will lead us in the offertory prayer. Let us pray. Jesus, give us a more charitable spirit, more self-denial, more likeness to you. Teach us to sacrifice our comforts for others' good. Make us kindly in thought, gentle in word, and generous in our giving. Teach us that it is better to give than to receive better to forget ourselves than to seek our own, better to minister than to be ministered unto.
one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us to pray. Free us for joyful. I invite you to add your own silent prayer of confession. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love towards us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. Please join me in the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. O Son in the highest, blessed be she who comes in the name of the Lord. O Son in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which Jesus gave himself up for us, he took the bread, gave thanks to you, and broke the bread. And said, take, eat. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this remembrance of me. When the supper was over, Jesus took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you, for this is the blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice, in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ is God. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with